Hi everyone, in this video I'll be showing an easy way to make a mini sandblaster. This is a project that can be completed from start to finish in literally five minutes, but what I'll be using the sandblaster for requires a little bit more patience. I was inspired to make a mini sandblaster for the purpose of fossil preparation. In the hands of an expert, incredible details can be revealed in fossils like this one, using a sandblaster to slowly erode away the rock that surrounded this fragile trilobite. Work like this is often done with the assistance of a microscope, and detailed fossils can take many hours to carefully reveal. I am not an expert, so my results are not likely to be nearly this spectacular, but I do often find fossils when I go for a hike or dig through the sand at the beach, and it would be fun to learn the basics of how to carve the rock away so I can see what they really look like. Of course, a sandblaster can be useful for all sorts of other things, but fossil preparation is the reason I wanted to build one in this video. The first item for this project is a small metal tube. You can find these brass tubes at most hardware stores, and I'll put the exact specifications in the video description below. A section about 5 inches or 12 centimeters long is snipped off, and if the end is crimped closed after being snipped, it should be opened up again. By using a round file, the next step is to cut a hole through the side of the brass tube, about a third of the way from one end. The file I'm using here is made for sharpening chainsaws. This hole is where the sand will enter the tube. This brass tube is too small to connect directly to an air compressor line, so I'll use a length of vinyl tubing as an intermediary connection. The brass tube is partially inserted into the vinyl, and then I use hot glue to create a solid plug around it. The last item required is the container that will hold the sandblasting media. This can be as large as a soda bottle if you would like a lot of capacity, or it can be a tiny medicine bottle if you'd like the sandblaster to be lightweight and easy to control. Using a drill bit that's just a little bit smaller in diameter than the brass tube, a hole should be poked all the way through the selected container. When you then force the brass tube through these holes, it should be a tight fit, so no air will leak around it. If I did everything correctly, the hole I filed in the brass earlier will now be inside the bottle, and this sandblaster is ready to use. Before you go sandblasting anything though, it's extremely important for your safety to wear a respirator. If you don't have breathing protection, don't use a sandblaster. Likewise, full laboratory safety goggles are required to protect your eyes. You need an air compressor to make this work, and I selected a vinyl tube that would fit tightly into the mouth of an air compressor blowgun, which will act as my control valve. For my initial tests, the blasting media I used was just regular white play sand. This worked really well, and it didn't clog the sandblaster at all. This sandblaster can be used to clean parts or etch glass, since sand is of similar hardness to glass itself. I had an old fish tank lying around which I used to make a sandblasting chamber to contain the dust so it doesn't coat everything in my workshop. To do this, I used a piece of foam board to close off the open side of the fish tank, with only two holes for my arms and a tiny hole for the sandblaster line to lead inside. A larger sandblaster would require an outlet hole that led to an air filter, but since this one uses a relatively tiny volume of air, it has no trouble escaping through the small gap between my arms and the holes in the box. The sleeves of my shirt occupy this gap, which is actually what I'm counting on to filter out the dust. I wouldn't rely on this level of air filtration completely without other respiratory protection, but it's enough to keep the dust from filling my shop. The downside of this setup is that I noticed the fish tank was slowly turning opaque, as the glass was damaged by the sandblasting inside. Ideally, a sandblasting chamber should be made in such a way that the glass can be replaced. White play sand worked well for my initial tests, but for delicate fossils, we should probably select a gentler blasting media. The perfect media would be one that is hard enough to blast away the rock surrounding a fossil, but too soft to damage the fossil itself. Fortunately, most fossils are a little bit harder than the rock that surrounds them, which is usually limestone. Professional fossil preparators use a sandblasting media like powdered dolomite, which is a natural mineral just a little bit harder than limestone. You can purchase dolomite online, 
but a more accessible option is to use baking soda. Baking soda is pretty soft compared to limestone, but with enough air pressure, the particles blast out with a lot of energy, enough energy to erode rock. I practiced for a while on pieces of sandstone I had lying around my yard before aiming this sandblaster at a real fossil. I had a few fossils of shells that I had found myself, which were my first real victims. For the most part, I destroyed them. I did, however, purchase some fossil trilobites online, which cleaned up pretty nicely once I got the hang of things. I got these for about $2 each because they were already damaged. The real test will be this fossil, which is an actual dinosaur tooth, once belonging to a mosasaur. This was an ocean-dwelling dinosaur that shed its teeth like a shark, which makes them pretty common to find as fossils. I'll try to excavate this tooth from the stone by cutting around it with the sandblaster. This, by the way, is not a fossil with any scientific or monetary value. I wouldn't risk practicing on a fossil that was actually an important discovery. The process of carving away the rock went pretty smoothly using baking soda. It wasn't nearly this easy on some of the other types of rock that I practiced on. Eventually I had the tooth only attached by a small pillar underneath, and I was able to snap it off. Once I could turn the tooth over, it was easy to clean off the remaining rock. I was all too happy at this point how well this was turning out, but just as I was about to finish, disaster. No. The tip of the tooth broke off in my fingers and the rest of it went flying across the room, breaking into several other pieces. I luckily found them all, even though I was doing this outside of the sandblasting chamber for the sake of getting a clear image for the camera. This isn't as big of a disaster as it might seem. Fossils often need to be glued together to repair naturally forming cracks. A professional probably would have noticed that my fossil was going to break and would have filled the fractures with super glue before it could actually happen. For me, it was a lesson learned. I was able to reconstruct the tooth with some super glue gel, even after it broke in a different place as I was repairing it. Any excess glue can be cleaned up with the sandblaster when I'm finished. And this is it, an extracted mosasaur tooth. It's pretty interesting that you can still see the hollow inside where there once was a nerve. This fossil is now solid rock, but it still looks organic. And here's what I ended up with. I now have the tooth mounted to a wire on this little piece of acrylic to be my display stand. And this is my Mosasaur, who may not have teeth, but would happily destroy this one if I let him get his beak on it. So I think I better set this aside. My efforts in this video to dig fossils out of stone are part of my continuous goal of learning new skills. Preparing fossils may seem like an oddly specific skill, but along the way I learned how to use a sand blaster, I learned something about etching glass, and I'm now a little better at working with super glue. This kind of knowledge builds on itself. It's how I come up with most of the ideas for my videos. I have a sponsor for this video that fits very well with my philosophy on this subject. Skillshare is a learning community for creators for things like digital media, if you want to make videos like I do. Or you can learn about product design and marketing, which I would like to do. I have lots of ideas for inventions and products that I'd like to sell, but the process is daunting, to say the least. Skillshare has many courses on this subject that have helped to clarify the steps that I need to take to make this happen. One area I struggle with is the aesthetics of my inventions. I make things that often work, but they look nothing like an item you would find on a store shelf. The course Product Design, How to Launch Successful Products by Joey Roth has given me a lot to think about in this area. This is just one example of a course on Skillshare, but really you should check them out yourself and learn about some of your own interests. You can do this for free because Skillshare is giving away a two-month unlimited access trial to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. 
I hope you liked this video and it gave you some useful ideas. Talk to me in the comments below. I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.